Thank you all so much for joining for today's National Water Quality Monitoring Council's Volunteer Monitoring Webinar, Behind the Curtain of Creating, Operating, and Maintaining a Standardized Monitoring Collaborative Network. Hi, I'm Julie Bastien. It's my privilege to chair the National Water Quality Monitoring Council's Volunteer Monitoring Work Group. Uh, the council was created in 1998 and is currently managed by the Environmental Protection Agency. And the council serves as an informational resource seeking to advance the monitoring community through collaboration and information exchange. In 2016, the Council approved the creation of the Volunteer Monitoring Workgroup with the goal to better integrate volunteer monitoring activities with ongoing water quality monitoring conducted by local, state, federal, and tribal entities. Thank you so much to Sophie Stern and the Alliance for Chesapeake Bay for hosting today's webinar. Uh, thank you to Phoebe Gallione with Dickinson College's Alliance for Aquatic Resource Monitoring, who will help with the transference to a YouTube video, which will be posted to websites and sent to you all afterwards. Um, and also want to give a huge thank you to the work group's uh, webinar committee, to Maslin, Rebecca Bond, Emily Sierra, Liz Chidoba, Ibrahim Goodwin, Daniel Haig, Susan Holdsworth, and Megan Smart. So as we said before, the webinar will be recorded and it'll be shared with everyone who has registered. And now I'm gonna pass the microphone off to Rebecca Bond with the Oklahoma Conservation Commission to introduce the webinar and our speakers. Take it away, Rebecca. Thank you, Julie. As you all know, collaboration and working with diverse partners is often a crucial ingredient in assessing water quality. Today, we are going to hear from the Cleveland Water Alliance's Lake Erie Volunteer Science Network about their journey, developing a collaborative network. We will have 40 minutes of presentations followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. Please write your questions in the chat. Julie and Ibrahim will facilitate the Q&A. We have two speakers today. First is Max Herzog, who is an impact professional dedicated to engaging diverse stakeholders in the development of tools and strategies that drive community innovation, equity, and resilience at the regional level. He is currently working at the nexus of intelligent water systems, technology-led economic development, and Great Lake Basin Management as a program manager with the Cleveland Water Alliance. Next up will be Barb Horn. Barb worked for Colorado Parks and Wildlife for 33 years, founding a community science program, Colorado River Watch. She has co-created multiple monitoring and data sharing collaboratives at all scales. She is valued as a national leader and expert for community scientists serving in various roles, commissions, and committees. I first met Barb at the 2019 National Monitoring Conference and was wowed by her, and I'm still wowed by her five years later. A Colorado native, she claims she reached her maximum potential at five years old and has been trying to get back to it ever since. Take it away, Barb and Max. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Um, and thanks all for having us here today. I'm um, just gonna go ahead and share my screen and start the presentation. Here we go. Um, all right, as I said, I'm Max Herzog. I'm a program manager with Cleveland Water Alliance, and I'll be presenting here with Barb today about the Lake Erie Volunteer Science Network. Um, however, before we dive in, we want to get a sense of who is in the audience today. Um, and so Barb is going to drop a link in the chat here in a moment, and um, it will be a, a link to a survey that'll ask whether you're involved in or are planning to be involved in uh, monitoring collaboration and or monitoring standardization effort. So if you could just take a moment to complete this survey, um, it'll give us a sense of who we're talking to and um, uh, just give us a sense, yeah, who's in the audience here today and what context y'all might have on the work we're talking about. like there's a request for the link again I will just copy paste it oops yeah can you see it oh I see we're posting this just to the panelists I see to everyone one moment thank you 
Oh, thanks, Megan. Thanks, y'all, for chiming in. Barb, are you seeing some completions come in? Slowly, Max. Give me another minute here. For sure. Hmm. What is happening? <laughs> what is happening? I'm sure, that's the same link. Yeah. It's kind of stuck. Hmm. Okay. I see a okay. comment in the chat that the link isn't working. Oh. Uh, I'll work on that. And then why don't you go ahead and I'll put it in there so we can Sounds still get good. a sense. Yeah. So when you have a chance, folks, chime in there and we'll report back um once we get some uh um Hmm. some completions and if Barb can figure this out. Um, but just to give you a sense, first of all, of where I'm coming from and getting involved in this work, I'm with a nonprofit in Northeast Ohio called the Cleveland Water Alliance. And our work is really focused on volunteer monitoring, um, but rather on uh, water technology innovations. So we're really interested in supporting universities, businesses, government agencies in developing, implementing innovative technologies to have a positive impact on Lake Erie region water quality, and also on helping to grow business in this area um, as a job driver. Um, but through this lens, we have a real interest in uh, thinking about Lake Erie Basin water quality. And for those of you not from the Great Lakes region, um, maybe not familiar with, with our basin, uh, Lake Erie is the most biodiverse and bioproductive of the Great Lakes, um, which also means, unfortunately, that it's the most historically and currently impacted by human activities um, and also the most vulnerable to further impacts from climate change. So when you think about water quality issues in the United States and really across the world, we experience quite a lot of them um, from microbial contamination, from combined sewer overflows to harmful algae. Um, and issues with aging, uh, drinking and storm, uh, drinking stormwater and wastewater infrastructure, we really experience all of these issues. And left unmanaged, looking across um, our lake, which also is the most densely populated of the Great Lakes, um, these impacts will be measured in the billions of dollars and felt for generations. And so thinking about the role of um, technology in this, um, addressing these sort of water quality threats, we really look at the gaps in data across the region. Um, the fact that with all these water quality issues um, and limited institutional capacity to collect data um, on what's going on across our watersheds in the open lake, it can be difficult to establish the early warnings and event detections, um, prioritization of restoration and mitigation actions, and really providing locally actionable information that allows communities to protect themselves um, it's difficult to, to fill these needs with the current data ecosystem that we have. And so coming at this from a technology perspective, Cleveland Water Alliance really thinks about this as a need to create a smart Lake Erie watershed, um, borrowing some of the sort of philosophies and technical concepts of the smart cities movement, the idea of highly distributed data collection, big data analytics, and leveraging them for public good. Um, bringing that to bear on the idea of Great Lake or the, the the discipline of Great Lake management. And so, you know, at a fundamental level, this means collecting more data um, and really working to transform the data that is collected into insights that can be used for management uh, purposes. So we're doing a lot in this area. A lot of it is deploying high frequency in situ sensors um, on the lake in the on the shoreline, um, in the near shore area and in the watersheds. Um, but we also want to consider other possibilities. And so thinking about these issues and, and what other assets we have in the region that can help to fill some of these data gaps is really how we came to uh, the idea of citizen community science. 
um, and, you know, in Lake Erie, across the Great Lakes, and as I'm sure you all know, across the world in a lot of cases, communities are really ready to take action around water quality. Um, and we're really seeing, as I'm sure you all are aware, an increase uh, in credibility of these activities in terms of seeing them as scientifically rigorous um, and being able to leverage the data for impact. And so the question that we brought to this conversation is, can we unlock the potential of volunteer monitoring, um, which, you know, in our region, at least has arisen uh, a lot in response to local water quality issues um, to address regional information gaps um, while strengthening that kind of local focus that's really core to these groups mission. And so this was the, the sort of um, motivating force behind pulling together the Lake Erie Volunteer Science Network. And this is a group, I believe now 13 or 14 uh, groups that collect water quality data across the region. This, this map and these logos need to be updated slightly. We were really fortunate to be able to partner with a network of community foundations across the region to provide some initial funding support to engage these communities in conversation about what it would mean for um, local level water quality monitoring driven by residents to become more organized and coordinated at the regional level. And so, you know, we were really fortunate to be able to go through um, a really engaged um, and de democratic process of creating the conditions for collective impact. And as I mentioned, we were extremely fortunate. I know it's rare in this sector to really come to the table with some funding to say to these groups, we can compensate you um, for coming to the table and talking with us about what it would mean for you to collaborate, what you would want to get out of a regional collaboration, um, and what that could look like. And through that, we were able to really engage in a series of pilots, you know, initially of uh, different water quality monitoring technologies, um, implementing a shared data platform, creating uh, educational tools. And through these pilots, this lasted probably for, you know, an initial two years before we were able to really dig deeper into understanding um, what folks would really want to do together. We were able to listen to our participating groups and hear from them what are their what are their motivating factors in terms of coming together um, to collaborate and what is the impact that they'd like to have together. And by engaging folks with with funding support and with projects um, that they could test out to see if um, they were exciting, if they were motivating, we were able to reach some consensus around a shared goal. And that goal was to standardize for increased credibility and capacity to align for greater collective impact. So there are two, two kind of elements here. As I said, obviously, you know, the community science, citizen science world um, is really being starting to be considered more credible by a lot of different uh, water data collectors and end users. However, there are still real challenges. I mean, we certainly experience that here in the Lake Erie Basin. Um, in terms of local data users, but particularly some of the more regional data users like our state environmental agencies, um, viewing volunteer collected data as credible enough to use. And so um, increasing that credibility and the, the amount of trust that is in their data was a real priority for our participating groups. And um, the other component was really thinking about how they could align their interests together, trying to identify where are the overlaps in priority between their individual programs so that they could pull more um, together at the regional level. And this is where we're really fortunate to partner with, with BARB and with the Water Data Collaborative to walk through a really rigorous process to identify those overlapping interests. So I'll hand it over here to BARB to speak about that process. Welcome, everybody. I'm excited to be here, and thanks for all that you do and how you do it. I got the results from the poll, I'll verbally tell you, because this means that we're not alone here, is that uh, 40, 39 percent of everybody here are already in a monitoring collaborative. That's about 70 groups, and you know there's more across the, the nation. About 45 or 25 percent wanted to be or were planning to be in a monitoring collaboration. 
about 23% or 41 groups were already uh, in a standardization effort. We didn't ask if you liked or enjoyed that yet, but that would be a good question. And then 13% uh, or a smaller number, about 23 of you were planning or desired to be in a standardization effort. So we're not alone here amongst the 183 participants. So a big challenge in our field is for all data generators, not just uh, volunteer monitoring, uh, all data users, all decision makers, is to have a common language for which we can communicate what we're doing and not doing, like exists in the medical or the legal field, for example. So the first step in this Cleveland Water Alliance effort was to provide a framework that gave us this common language, a common way to communicate what we're doing and not doing, and then what would we do together? And then that would allow us to plan and evaluate that. Next slide, please. So the good news is you're all familiar with, and this shouldn't be new to any of you, that there really is an existing framework that everybody uses, and it's called the scientific method. Now, the scientific method is a closed study design, and we all have collectively evolved it to be an open monitoring design, one that can evolve based on the data that we gather, and we change that study design as we analyze and take actions. So we were calling this a study design framework that had four basic buckets of content, things that you would do. We call the first one, the purpose, the why, and then the technical design is what you do. The information is turning that data into information and delivering it. And then the evaluation is designing that. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Every single aspect of these, of the technical, the information and evaluation design, hit it again there, Max, uh, ser should serve the purpose and the why design bucket. And this is one of the buckets that most groups uh, somehow don't do a complete job or a sufficient job for their effort. But this bucket includes, and I'm presenting this linearly, but it doesn't happen linearly. It's a very iterative process. <clears throat> and every monitoring program has some design, whether it's known or unknown, whether it's documented or not, whether it's formal or informal. I like to say that your community swimming pool that monitors the chlorine and pH to make it safe to swim, that is a monitoring design. So the purpose and why bucket is where you're looking at the program vision, the values, the scale and scope of your program. Uh, key here is identifying what we're calling, we call monitoring purpose, data uses, and they are different for this purpose. It's where your monitoring questions are, <clears throat> and, and identifying who's going to use the data and what information do they need so we make sure that we collect it. And then a lot of groups don't do this, but actually identifying the result and the outcomes and the impacts, not of gathering the data, but of using the data and then the impacts of the use of data. This is where we also lump in who's doing this. So if you're using volunteers, this is where you'd have your volunteer management plan. So this is the foundation for your program. The next, uh, hit it again there, Max, that anything you collect, what, when, where, and how, and the data quality objectives should be serving that purpose. And then how you manage the data, we call out how you manage the raw data that you collect and all the metadata and get it verified and it's ready then and QA'd and ready then for interpretation and analysis, which is the information design because managing data for analysis interpretation is very different than managing it just to get it uh, ready to use. <clears throat> this is also where you create your information product, which is a generic term for reports, report cards, presentations, social media, uh, all the things that you do to get the information and data out there. And then of course, how do you evaluate your program formatively and substantively? So these are the buckets that we were able to break down what people were doing and actually conduct an inventory of, of the groups in the Cleveland Water Collaborative here. So we asked them specific questions. <clears throat> Oops, hang on a second. Around those buckets and the information design. And just a note, you could standardize any part of those buckets, any one of those buckets you could standardize. Many people are involved in a data sharing effort that would be standardizing uh, your bucket two and your bucket three, uh, how you're collecting data and maybe how you're sharing it. That is exactly what the National Water Quality Portal does for folks. All right, sorry, Max, go ahead, next slide. <clears throat> 
So because this can be confusing, and again, this is not about being prescriptive or a right way, it was finding a framework that would work across everything that everybody is doing and communicate it in a way that was understandable. So we have found over time at the Water Data Collaborative and you know Julie Vastine and many, many groups use a version of this in their own work effectively. So this is not exactly about being the right way or the only way, it is a way to do this. So in the middle of this circle is your monitoring questions, your data objectives, which many groups start there. But the next circle out is your monitoring purposes. And I have found that these four purposes have served all the efforts I've worked on my career, including land-based monitoring, not just aquatic-based monitoring. That you're looking at a condition trend or your purpose for the data is an impact, like you're trying to figure out the extent of a, of a sewage outlet or a spill. Um, or effectiveness monitoring, you've done something, you've done a restoration project, you've changed a policy, you engaged uh, a bunch of farmers in a best management practices, and you want to know the effectiveness of that action. And then use support could be formal, like the Clean Water Act, <clears throat> excuse me, or it could be informal, such as the neighborhood kids will not go swim in the local pool when it's got all this green stuff in it. So it can be very informal. I have found these four purposes cover everything that we as a community do. Separating that, so it's finite in this case. From data uses, the next circle out, which is also finite, is the range of how data is used. Now this actually has a rigor or quality continuum. And you can look at the up top right there where the upper right where you can start with engagement and education and you can go around to behavior change, inquiry, research, advocacy, and so forth to the most rigorous end, which is typically legal or compliance or regulatory type monitoring. Everyone here knows enough that there's a rigor with quality assurance and sampling and protocols and the technical design in this data use. But I wanna plant a seed in there that you can have a purpose for condition trend, I wanna know how my waters are doing. I wanna know if it's safe to swim, if it's safe to drink this water. And that very same data set could be used if it's collected at, for education and compliance, for behavior change and watershed planning. And so separating out the purpose and the use helps us refine and understand what the technical design needs to be, the information design and the evaluation design. So it too is finite. <clears throat> the outer two circles, the third one is data users, which is infinite. And this is identifying who you plan to use the data, including yourself, and then understanding what information they actually need to use that data to make the identified decisions you want them to make. So you actually design your monitoring program to deliver that. And then identifying, and this all happens in the first bucket, what do you want to have happen? Because data should never be the end point. Mama monitoring is her mantra here. Data should never be the endpoint. I would argue not even using the data should be the endpoint. But what is the impact of using that data or information? What is the real change you're, you're trying to make? So we had the groups do an inventory of all of these. And through that inventory, next slide, Max. <clears throat> we were able to call out what people were doing and not doing, and then collaborate through consensus on what did this group want to do together. And I wanna just mention that what they started with, what they started with wanting to do before they went through this inventory and this process of exploring is different than what they ended up with right here. So they decided as a group that they, their purpose was to collect a common set of measures that support the screening so that's the data use, the screening of aquatic life impact as an indicator for baseline conditions and trends in the health of Lake Erie watersheds. They were gonna use this screening data to benchmark watershed health, to, uh, you, can, you can read here as much as I can, the interop to look at uh, the results across watersheds, that's one of their niches across the, the rivers that feed Lake Erie, and as education engagement for their local efforts in the community. And secondarily, it was going to be used as resource prioritization for other external uses, i.e. their DEQs or their DEP departments or something equivalent to that. This is not how they started out. 
They then identified that their target data users were basically themselves and their own constituents and their own group. But then they also would want to make it available. So using fair data standards or getting their data out of a known quality uh, uh, and available <clears throat> by other decision makers. And what they wanted to happen by getting this data used was again to help provide regional, uh, you take screening data usually, I'll just summarize these three, four bullets you can read, basically taking that data and using it to do more monitoring, to fill gaps, to identify potential problems, basically to inform protection or restor rest restoration efforts at a local and a watershed and a Lake Erie level. They decided uh, to do low hanging fruits. And this is a decision you would need to make. They decided to standardize PHDO temperature and conductivity because most of the groups were already doing that. And because they were building on something most were doing, they could actually spend most of their energy on creating a foundation. All the other uh, spokes and wheels and lubrication that require a standardization and collaboration to work. In doing that, they came up with a list of things that they could prioritize, and they've collected that as a prioritization menu that they evaluate every year to decide what to prioritize next. And that also had feedback with the external partners they work with. Of course, the effort produced a bunch of documentation uh, like SOPs, user guides, reporting templates. They're using a, a collective database management system, a water reporter that also has an analysis widget. <clears throat> and they're working, uh, as Max will say later, describe later to, to scale this process. The last thing I then wanna mention is that they did not intend to analyze when they made the decision that they were the primary data users, that meant that they were going to analyze and interpret and make recommendations for the data itself. Uh, not a groups don't do that. They just provide the data, but that created a whole nother effort of standardization and collaboration. And it also will create a whole nother set of benefits for this effort. I think that's all Max. Yeah, so this is really Barbus walked you through a bit how we went through this process of leveraging the study design framework that she and the Water Data Collaborative um, and her colleagues there have put together and how it let us really understand where the groups already aligned um, and where then it was within, within their interest to collaborate. And so using this framework, we built out, um, you know, what I would say is a, a fairly successful regional collaboration. We currently have a network of 13 local hubs that are committed to standardized data collection, analysis, and storytelling. Um, that number is actually a little in flux. I think we're going to be onboarding at least three new hubs this year, um, but I'll know for sure by the end of next month. And I really want to highlight that, um, you know, as Barb said, it's not just about standardizing how we're collecting the data. A lot of the work has really been more about how do we agree upon benchmarks for what counts as an exceedance? How do we map um, what those benchmarks are across a wide range of locations, different eco-regions, um, warm and cold streams, et cetera? And then also, how do we organize the output of that analysis into a coherent report? How do we develop you know, accompanying information products that help us communicate out you know, what is quite a technical report um, in a way that's accessible to not just, you know, researchers and decision makers that might be interested, but everyday folks in the community. Um, and so yes. that's a lot of work. So sorry, I just wanted to give you the 10 minute warning. Okay, thank you. Um, so through this, we have a shared study design, uh, data infrastructure, as Barb mentioned, everyone's using Water Reporter to store and um, analyze their data. And we also have now a repository of sampling and analysis tools um, where we at Cleveland Water Alliance have multi-parameter sensors that we loan out to folks long-term to participate in the, in the network. Um, and through Water Reporter, we're able to offer um, additional functionality on top of what Water Reporter normally does with this you know, custom widget that they've built for us. We also have organized the group uh, further to enable folks that want to dive deeper in supporting the network to do so. Um, so we have a working group focused on standards that's led a lot of this process that we've talked through, a working group um, that is focused on equity and justice, that's exploring how our group can better center the needs of marginalized communities um, in our work, 
and a steering committee that's working at kind of the strategy level um, for development and growth. And through this, we were actually able to transition into post-grant funded operations. We had three years of funding through the community foundations, um, and now we've done about a year and a half of unfunded operations where we've had additional groups join with no funding and our groups that were participating with funding before continue to participate um, and really ramp up participation um, despite lack of external support, which I think really underscores how closely we are, how hard we've worked to align the network closely with the group's individual goals. And I won't dive into this, but just to give you a sense that we're really structuring this um, and that we think this is a model for how people and data can be organized into a coherent regional hub that can uh, monitor water quality, organize and, and leverage that data, but also collaborate around particular interest areas um, to develop internal leadership and capacity um, and continue to evolve. Right now we define our niche within the monitoring ecosystem as um, having a wide geographic coverage and high spatial resolution where we are present. Um, the standardization and the scalability across the network. So once we, um, not only is our data interoperable, kind of comparable and, and um, in, able to be integrated across the basin, but also when we adopt new standards, they can be rapidly scaled. Um, also, our groups bring a local context that informs interpretation and management, um, which can further inform the uh, spatial resolution and the usability of the data by other stakeholders. Um, because they already have the ties in with the community, our partners can make data available to the public rapidly. Um, in a locally relevant way and help communities interpret the data, something that um, higher level agencies or even research institutions can sometimes struggle to do. Um, and these groups also often have a mandate to take it one step further to empower communities to take action. Um, then looking at the regional level, you know, we're able to really drill down, I think, on the impact at the local level. We're now able to actually integrate data from Ann Arbor to Buffalo and tell a story about the health of um, watersheds across the Lake Erie Basin for the first time. In terms of broader impacts, this increased credibility and the technical tools are helping these groups expand on their missions to build local resilience. Um, the integratability and comparability of the data will also help fill regional data gaps. Um, and we're also creating social capital, both connecting these groups to each other and supporting them and engaging with one another for the first time, um, and also starting to forge connections between them and the agencies and professional research world. Um, and of course, there's also the capacity to continue to innovate and grow through these multiple working groups and the evaluation, annual evaluation process that Barb touched on. So what are we doing now to grow the network? We're trying to engage um, additional capacity in a number of ways. Obviously, direct funding is needed and we're applying for grants and engaging with funders to try and source this. Um, to enable us to continue to really have the capacity to staff um, the network and have that regional management. However, you know, participant engagement is also um, just as important, if not more important. Having groups that are willing to contribute data, contribute time, and really step up into leadership roles is what has enabled us to transition into sort of a post-funded space um, and has allowed us the breathing room to consider how we grow our funding sources in the future. We also are looking for technical resources and scientific expertise, particularly getting agency and research folks to participate in some of our working groups has been really tremendously helpful. Um, and so we're looking to scale that. Um, we're also looking to build then those data user relationships and ultimately move past the level that we've really centered uh, to date, which is getting these individual groups, the data that they need in a credible way to do their work and then be able to tell this regional story. We want this data to be eventually leveraged by um, some of those external users. Uh, locally is certainly starting to happen, but tapping in more into the state agency um, and regional agency world as well. And so in general, bringing these components together, what we're really trying to do with this network is build um, not just standardization and technical capacity, but organizational capacity and leadership. Um, ultimately, we at Cleveland Waterlines want to elevate the program 
beyond what we as an organization can do. And I think we've we've made huge strides in that direction um, by cultivating a network of, of groups that actually have ownership over the work and are really starting to take on more responsibility, take responsibility away from Barb and from myself um, and, and really start to run the analysis, run the evaluation process, determine what their priorities are um, without um, kind of that central leadership being as key. And we really feel that we're we're continuing to build momentum every year. Um, this is this will be our third year of standardized water quality data monitoring, and every year we've added at least three new groups. I want to say, I mean, we seem to be on track to actually exceed that this year. And so we're really excited about the engagement that we've seen across the region, and we hope that we can really leverage this into uh, continuing to grow the impact in the future. And one of the um, early signs of that is that um, Barb and I and a couple of environmental engineering firms in the Great Lakes region have worked with the International Joint Commission, a um, the agency that represents the interests of the US EPA and Environment and Climate Change Canada around the management of the Great Lakes. Um, we developed for them a framework that really outlined a lot of the components that you saw here today with the study design framework for how the Great Lakes region needs to support community science. Um, and now we've actually landed and presented earlier today to the IJC about a second phase of the contract that'll flesh out um, what it would look like for Great Lakes agencies to support sort of hubs of community science activity. So we really hope that that sort of is um, setting us up to continue to scale this and also enable groups across the region to really benefit from the model that we're developing here. Barb, I'll hand it over to you to wrap up real quick. So bringing this back up to a larger scale, I'm one of those people that don't like, uh, when I get a, it's like getting something from Ikea. I don't. I want all the parts list. I don't want the top three things. I want it all. And so we're going to leave you with uh, some checklists and tips that might help you in your own effort. And I won't go over them all, but they'll be here as a resource. But I have found over my time that these two things stand out, that you can collaborate and it's different without standardizing. And you can standardize without collaboration. And I can give examples of that if you want to talk offline later. But you can do both. And the Cleveland Water Alliance did both. The key thing here is that whether you do one or the other, it should be a solution to an identified problem that helps you identify the why and the benefits and the outcomes. You shouldn't do it because it sounds good because everyone else is doing it. Every effort I've seen that's doing it because of that uh, fails. And like volunteer monitoring, uh, neither are free, but can be cost effective. Uh, next slide. There's always possible benefits and uh, for both. And so we identified those. And it's really, really important to identify them because you're gonna go through resistance and hard times and patience is required, and you want to always connect back to the benefits and why people are doing this. Next slide, please. Again, you can go through these later. There are risks, and you want to identify those risks. Loss of autonomy is usually a big one. Uh, the time that it's going to take, it takes time to work with people, and in our sense of urgency culture, nobody wants to do it. Uh, and it might mean people have to change. This group was really willing to change. When you standardize things, you're changing for in service of something better. Um, and you usually need a critical mass and you can define that, but that critical mass can be in the buy-in, it can be in resources, it can be, uh, you'll see, I have a little more on that in a minute. Next slide, please. So this is a checklist you can go through. It's the entire ingredients package from Ikea here of what you would wanna think about at a high level if you're gonna standardize. And I'll just call out a few things. The buy-in you might see there, you need to get political buy-in, financial buy-in. You need to figure out what kind of buy-in you need from who. And most people don't take the time to do that, get them at the table early. The benefits, the risks, the fears identify. Do a process map. What workflows are involved in standardizing? What are the indirect and uh, formal informal workflows, uh, what are the indirect and direct uh, unintended or unintended impacts? Thinking that through will help you a lot, taking that time in the future. Have a framework, um, have a way to monitor and evaluate this effort or folks will just start stop participating. You have to have a way to also measure the performance 
of the standardization and allow people a way to exit or enter or improve if they can't meet that standardization. Many, many efforts, like with our state agencies who create uh, methods to share the data and requirements, don't really follow through on how to help people get there, how to enter, how to improve and to get there on that. Um, sometimes it might be, be used as a way by those agencies to actually not use the data. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the classic, you can go online and say, what would it take? What are the key ingredients of a collaboration? I'm not gonna go through this because this is classic and you already know it, but I will call out the blue items there that you're also sharing power. Uh, you wanna be transparent about your sharing power. Um, identifying roles and engagement and expectation management is key. Accountability is key, it can be often forgotten. When you work with other people, you need emotional intelligence. It sounds obvious, but often it's not present. And then uh, you wanna think about how you might scale this at the beginning. So these are the classic checklist things. Now Barb is gonna give you the secret ingredients that are often overlooked. You need a common language, key terms, concepts, a framework. You need to figure out what that means for you, but you need a common way to talk about what you're doing. And don't assume that a term means a term. One key thing about leadership that I've seen over and over is that often the group that's providing the initial leadership needs to have uh, the ability to talk across political boundaries. Cleveland Water Alliance is not Ohio based. It can talk to Canada. It can talk to New York. Too many of these efforts, I was involved in a Rocky Mountain effort that failed because no one would fund. The Rocky Mountain region is like three EPA regions. Nobody would fund something that was out of their, their region. And so it really is a critical part of this. You need your champions. Um, you need different kinds of flexibility, cognitive and dispositional. You just need somebody who's gonna be a champion during the hard times. Uh, a lot of patience, again, in our sense of urgency culture, we don't have a lot of that when we deal with, with um, others. And I'd also encourage, uh, you can, Contact Max after this and get specific tools and things that, that they employed, like performance MOU agreements, uh, the SOPs, the, the tools that they employed to get this minimum criteria and some of the to implement the program. So you can look at this uh, checklist and see what might help you. We're at the two minute warning, my friends. We're good here because if you're in one already in a standardization and collaboration effort, I encourage you to assess it, to evaluate it, to feed it, to, if you're not happy with it, find out why, you know, keep working on it because collaboration is the way of the future, obviously. If you haven't started one, just start somewhere. Small, do a pilot, do a beta, take the time to build a foundation so people have a good experience, they'll be around. I am amazed at the ownership that this, this LeBlaf network has. Uh, because the individuals have psychological uh, ownership over every part of this, they're sharing the leadership, they're sharing the work, they're sharing uh, the direction of it, and it's really a key element. So both Max and I would be available for more questions offline. Uh, I think we're, we're done. Max, you want to say any closing? Um. I think we're 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 at time here. The the one last thing I would re-highlight is that Barb's focus on evaluation and continued evolution of the project has really been it's something that I wouldn't have focused as much on um in the first years, particularly because it took a lot of extra effort and in some ways was kind of painful because it meant asking people to really get into the nitty-gritty of what didn't work um and focus in on that. But we've already seen having executed now our second year, the evolution from year one to year two is incredible like we it was so much more efficient it was so much easier for everyone and i think we'll continue to see that re refine um even just like the way we evaluate it i think this year will be much more efficient than last year um and so uh that's really something that I, i've learned from this process it's, it's really tremendously helpful Nice. Well, the questions have been piling in, and I just have to say this presentation, my heart was singing through so many parts of that. So thank you, Barb and Max. Um, so we have a couple of questions getting into the nuts and bolts of the program and how you have it set up. And just a reminder that I, Ibrahim, and Megan are going to uh, rotate and ask questions. So let's get to it. 
So can you all describe the roles that the volunteer scientists play, um, ranging from the sampling, field data analysis, et cetera? And then the other nuts and bolts question is, what are the roles of quality assurance project plans and standard operating procedures in the use of certified labs? So really nuts and bolts, who does the work, how does it get done, and what are the tools to ensure credibility? For sure. So to, just to tackle the first one, the role of volunteers is really in the actual collection of the data. But the volunteers are the folks that are getting trained on how to use the instruments that we use. They're going out there and collecting the samples, and then they're bringing it back to their local organizers. Um, from there, the organizers generally take the lead in terms of actually analyzing the data. Um, we have had some efforts to try and increase volunteer leadership. Um, in terms of inviting folks onto our steering committee. It's been difficult, to be honest, to get folks to volunteer into that role as we've had one volunteer uh, step forward. Um, but they really do serve as the backbone of, of the entire network, obviously. Um, in terms of SOPs um, and QAPs, we don't have an official QAP, but we do have a very extensive SOP that was developed based on the uh, sort of program design that you saw in short uh, during our presentation, there's a 80, 90 page version of that that expl explores how we're actually um, not just collecting the data, but really gets into the nitty gritty of how we're analyzing and interpreting results. Um, one element of standardization that didn't get teased out as much here is how we're considering metadata, both at the station level and at the individual sample level. So we get into a lot of detail there. Um, and really the reason we approach the the reason we approach this from the perspective of developing our own SOP for the network versus adopting a QAP from an individual state is because right now our participation bridges across three states. There's four U.S. states on Lake Erie, and this coming year should be the first year that we're actually engaging participants from Ontario. And so it's really difficult for us um, to think about how we align with a specific state. We did look at the state standards for the three states and Ontario um, that we've been engaging in and worked to align as closely as possible with those. But there are different approaches, not just in terms of um, quality assurance and data collection and analysis, but in terms of the administrative processes and certifications that groups are required to um, move through. So it's something that we're definitely talking about for the future is, you know, providing guidance for groups on a state by state basis on how to connect more directly with their state agencies. But we've really prioritized sort of building momentum as a whole um, region wide effort. And because of that, um, the, the state level co-ops haven't been uh, as central to our strategy. All right, Ibrahim, I think you have the next question. Okay, um, there were several. One in particular was about uh, QAPs and whether or not uh, there is a QAP that all uh, participating organizations are using. So essentially, yes. Um, it, it's sort of what we just spoke to. We don't we don't sign on to a QAP with a particular state, but we do have a set of standard operating procedures that fulfill all of those um, kind of key components. Max, and if I could add that that was developed by looking at this includes the analysis benchmarks and the analysis in, uh, standard SOP. Uh, we looked at all the states, what they were doing. We looked at other resources because states aren't all the gurus in monitoring. Uh, we looked at everything that was out there. So we didn't start from scratch, but we decided what you know what were people doing, um, and folks are also using uh, one. It's the same equipment right now. So the their anal the analysis of DO temperature and conductivity is not requiring a lab. But what this group did is they set up the foundation that anything they standardize next. So let's say they do nitrogen. Let's say they do the macrovertebrates. Let's say they do physical habitat. They will go through all the elements of the study design bucket and figure out what they need to collect, the QAC, the QAQC, what's the benchmark, how are they going to manage it, it, it's all set up to standardize. That's why it can, can scale quickly. And we have solicited input from state agencies in this process. We've had Ohio EPA has a, a scientist that's been on our standards working group from the beginning, and he's helped us tremendously by connecting us with um, particularly uh, representative data sets of macroinvertebrate measurements across Ohio that we use to help assess our conductivity measurements. 
Um, we have some from New York DEC as well uh, now participating. So in short, the SOP includes all the QAP elements. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, I'll pass it over to Megan. So this next question you guys kind of touched on a little bit, but it's more to do with frequency. So um, do each of the states around Lake Erie have different monitoring frequency requirements for data analysis? If so, how do you standardize that frequency for all groups in the network? And how would you recommend standardizing groups within a watershed where each water sub-watershed needs a different focus due to its ge geographical locations? Yeah, we. this is a great question because this is actually something that we didn't touch on here. At a very base level from a sampling perspective, the only things we've standardized are the technology and QAQC used to collect and the frequency at which, the minimum frequency at which sampling happens. So we require all of our participating groups to sample at least once per month at every station uh, that they monitor. They have a minimum of one station, but they have to sample if they just do one, once a month from April through October. Folks are able to sample outside of that window if they want to. They're able to sample more frequently if they want to. Um, but that's sort of the base level. And that was really determined based on what our groups were already doing and what they decided was sort of minimum viable product and also the minimum feasible product, considering the capacity of different groups. So we do have some groups that monitor twice per month, for example. Um, but that's that's sort of the minimum that we said. Awesome. Cool. So a uh, couple of other nuts and bolts questions for you. Um, so you mentioned data sharing pathways. You mentioned your work uh, with the Commons and Water Reporter. Um, so folks who are interested in hearing a little bit more about those data sharing pathways and whether or not it's making its way to data would make its way to the Water Quality Exchange um, and downloadable through the Water Quality Portal. Yeah, so that's actually something that we're currently working on with the Water Reporter team. Um, we have a plan to, by the end of the year, get a process in place whereby annually we'll upload the data from the entire network to the um, Water Quality Exchange. Um, it requires some mapping and sort of analog processes because there's not an exposed API that we can leverage. Um, Water Reporter does have that API capacity, and so we're also working with um, a group funded by the Gordon Foundation called DataStream, that has been a really key data aggregator on the Canadian side and is working now to expand into the US um, with the Great Lakes product. And so with them, uh, we think we should actually be able to establish a real-time connection whereby the data is uploaded into Water Reporter um, makes its way into data stream as well. And so we're really interested in finding other sort of platforms like that when relevant that we can make connections with because the groups that we work with really just wanna see their data as many places as possible. Um, and in a lot of ways, um, in talking to some of our state folks, uh, if you get your data into the water quality exchange, folks just look at it and consider it more credible. Um, maybe don't think about whether it's volunteer collected or not. Um, and so that that is a really exciting step from our perspective um, as well. Nice. If, I, if I could add real quick uh, that the group initially wanted to send their data, but they during this process of inventory evaluation, they decided to get their act together first, if you will. And build a foundation, and uh, and I will say that uh, data that comes right off a meter, you know, we had to iteratively go back and convince folks that you actually do need to do rigorous data validation, and people are learning in this process that when you actually use the data yourself, you actually care about the quality, you have to care about how it shows up in a fair standards format. And that's been a learning. This is one way that the groups have improved their own performance internally, not just as the network. You cannot skip data validation, even if your data is automated. Automated. Yes, thanks, Barb. Um, so we are at 155. So uh, there's still a number of questions in the chat. Um, so not sure if you all have a chance to take a look at those. Um, but uh, I'll ask one, another question and then pass it off. Uh, to Ibrahim and Megan, if there's time. Um, so you mentioned the ability to fund partners to come to the conversation table. So like right from the outset, there is, you know, bringing people together and funding. Can you just expand upon why that was important to fund participation at the table and how you set that up? Um, and then can you also expand upon the perspectives that you wanted to have at that table um, to, to have these conversations? For sure, yeah. So we were extremely fortunate in the region to have 
um, the creation of this program really sync up with the timing of an initiative across the Great Lakes of community foundations called the Great Lakes One Water Partnership, or GLOW. Um, these groups were looking for how could they, as community foundations that typically fund within their local cities and municipalities, get together to support projects that have impact on water quality at the Great Lake level. And so we actually started engaging with whomever was doing volunteer water quality monitoring within the cities where these foundations were originally based so that we could establish sort of a local funding relationship for those groups. Um, and that was really fundamental because uh, not only um, it, because these groups, you know, have low capacity, these groups are doing the work with volunteers, they're also doing other things. And so getting them to come to the table and say, we'll pay you to have your staff and your volunteers have time to participate in these conversations um, really made a big difference. It also meant that we could keep the conversations more open. We did come in with, you know, initially the idea of getting everyone on water reporter and piloting a first water quality monitoring technology. Um, but having funding to bring people to the table, let us have more of an open-ended conversation as well to say, we're paying you, come tell us what you want to do. Um, and uh, I think it's a sort of thing where a lot of groups, they have the incentive to have the impact locally, and there aren't big incentives all the time to come together at more of the regional um, level. And so we were able to deliver some of those incentives and then kind of get the ball rolling in that way. Go ahead, I said, how about any tips or uh, uh, tricks to identify common priority among multiple volunteer groups? Really, this standard standard um, study design framework that Barb has developed was was really essential. Um, I think the criteria that it breaks down monitoring programs into are something that folks can understand, and it's something that we really hope can be scaled. We're working across the Great Lakes region, but but nationally, internationally. Um, I think even when there aren't opportunities for standardization, it lets folks talk to each other and explain what they're doing in a way that's understandable, comprehensible. People can see the value of groups, even if there isn't direct alignment in in with their objectives. Awesome. Well, there was robust questions in the chat. Um, so a couple. So we do need to bring this to a close because we're at the end of our hour. So just want to first start with thanking Barb and Max so much for taking the time to share you know, the behind the scenes of your right. collaborative and the lessons learned and the tools that you use to set that up. Um, and then thank you everyone who participated in the webinar, your great questions um, and being active in the chat. And thank you so much to our webinar team uh, for, for helping to facilitate this experience.